Hello and thank you for watching. We left off last time wondering if the male mouse would stop demonstrating aggression towards the female and if the mice would successfully copulate. The male had attempted to mount the female on previous occasions and could be seen continuing in that attempt. Now, in mice, the way that sexual behaviour occurs is that sniffing of the anogenital area preceded by the chasing, often followed by mating, and all of these are behaviours that we have uh, witnessed so far. Mounting itself does not mean that there has been ejaculation, and in mice, the male will need to mount repeatedly, often in short bursts characterised by um, some high frequency thrusts. These are often followed by a period of intromission, and that's the point at which the male has actually achieved insertion, followed by um, an abrupt dismount. And intromissions are characterised by less frequent but deeper thrusts, and again, there'll be repeated intermissions before the next stage of copulation occurs. During intromission, the frequency of the male's thrusting reduces and ultimately the male freezes and that's characteristic of ejaculation and so a true copulation. Here we can see all three stages of copulation occurring, including the changes in the frequency of the thrusting, um, culminating in that freezing behaviour and therefore likely ejaculation. Both mice will then groom themselves and the female can be seen stretching. I'm unsure if this is because she hadn't been partnered previously and was feeling um, uncomfortable or sore, or if this is a natural behaviour to all females. After copulation, there is a post-ejaculatory interval which can last from one hour up to a day and during that time the male will cease that courtship behaviour, um, but there is an increase in bonding behaviour. It was at this time that I added objects back into the cage as the male had stopped being aggressive towards the female. They both continue to groom themselves and each other, explore the environment and take the opportunity to eat and drink. In mice, when there is ejaculation, the formation of a seminal plug will be noted in the female. This is a whitish waxy blockage that can be seen in the opening of the female or on the cage floor in the early mornings after copulation. It doesn't guarantee that the female will become pregnant, but it does demonstrate that mating has successfully occurred. Female mice are polygamous, and this means that they'll um, mate with different males if given the opportunity. And this is one of the reasons why males are territorial. The formation of a plug means that if a female did encounter another male, he would be unable to copulate successfully with her. The plug lasts a variable amount of time, but usually around 12 hours. And as a female is at peak fertility for only 14 to 15 hours, this is a very effective method of males to try and ensure that they are the father of any offspring born from a particular mating. Now we discussed previously about how females may be able to um, control some of the copulation and uh, courtship behaviour of the male. The, the clearest um, option for them is obviously escape. So if a male does approach her and she is unwilling to breed at that time, uh, females are able to avoid the situation by simply running away. The other option is going to be um, the loud auditory squeaking that appeared at the end of the last video. And that is a form of rejection. The female um, are able to tell the males that they are uninterested or unwilling um, by making that sound. Another option, which we saw last video, is uh, the female is able to sit, lowering her tail, making it impossible for the male to achieve intromission. Now, with those combined, that gives the female a repertoire of behaviour that means she can control who would be the uh, potential father of any offspring that are born.
Now, the other options um, that females have is obviously to encourage mating behaviour. Um, so one of the simplest ways for a female to do that, if she feels um, inclined to, is to approach a male. By approaching a male and allowing him to uh, be near her and to smell her, she encourages that reproductive behaviour. While the mice explore, this is a good opportunity to discuss um, the housing requirements of these animals. So um, mice are very active at uh, dawn and dusk, so they do need plenty of um, toys. So a wheel, for example, is quite important as they like to run and they are naturally very fit and athletic. Um, things like tunnels, tubes, hammocks, um, seesaws, all of those um, sort of toys that you can get quite readily also allow mice to exhibit their natural behaviour. So being quite athletic, they do like to climb. So things like hammocks and anything um, hung from the ceiling is going to encourage that natural curiosity for them. Um, they are also naturally quite good at um, tunnelling and burying. So they like those sort of confined spaces and anything that um, moves or moves in a slightly unexpected way, hence um, things like seesaws, um, are also quite enriching for them. Um, of the most importance is going to be somewhere for them to hide and sleep. So um, here you can see that we use um, wooden houses. They do normally have a roof on. Um, that gives the mice somewhere dark, draft free and, and cosy for them to sleep in. Um, they should also be given bedding material. For example, there's tissue paper in here that allows them to shred it up. It's um, non-fragranced and it doesn't have any sort of colourings or anything like that to it. So if they do ingest some of it, it's not harmful to them. Um, that's going to allow them to make a nice warm nest um, and somewhere that they're going to be um, comfortable and happy to sleep. In the last video we talked about how the satin gene works and the way that it acts as a recessive. This time we'll talk about the asterisk or texel gene. This is a gene that the male demonstrates with his thicker wavy fur. In the UK there are two versions of this gene, one that is also recessive and one that is actually dominant. For us to know which variety of gene the male carries, we would need to consider what his parents were and what they are likely to have passed on to him and his litter mates. The other option is to wait and see what offspring he produces. If he's carrying the dominant variety, um, he would need to have one copy of the gene to have the curls that he demonstrates, and around half the pups would also have wavy fur. If the variety uh, in play here is the recessive, then he must have two copies of the gene for him to demonstrate the fur that he has. If this is the case and the female doesn't carry the recessive trait, then none of the pups will have the texel gene uh, and demonstrate it, should I say. However, they would all be carriers of the gene. They would be heterozygous for the texel recessive gene. If the female is a carrier of the texel recessive gene, then she would have one copy of it, and this would mean that most of the pups would have texel fur.